Hello and welcome back to Virtually Loads of Gordy. So today I'm planning to do something uh, I've been promising you for ages. 10 things you never knew about furnace. Well, 10 things that maybe some of you knew about Furnace if you read the blog post I did on this a while back. So 10 things that some of you might know about Furnace, but most of you probably don't know. Or maybe 10 things, some of which some of you might know, but some of you won't know some of them. Anyway, 10 things. Number one. The name Furnace Penitentiary actually came from a novel that I wrote when I was about 17 years old. This novel was called Asylum uh, for some reason, I can't remember why. Um, and it, the basic premise of it, you know, it was a nice, gentle, relaxing, romantic comedy really, about angels that ate people. So yeah, it was quite gory, quite graphic, and it was set in a place called the Furnace Penitentiary for the Criminally Insane. It was uh, a place a little bit like Arkham Asylum. Oh wait, that's probably why I called it Asylum. So yeah, uh, set in a place called um, Furnace Penitentiary, and the idea was that these angels would come back and attack the prisoners, and uh, I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was very gruesome and very gory. So I sent this book off to quite a few different places to try and get it published, and no one ever published it, uh, which is a story I'm gonna save for another vlog, actually, because, uh, I wrote that novel when I was supposed to be doing my exams at school, and that novel is the reason that I failed school. Uh, completely failed school the first time around, pretty much because of this novel. Uh, but I'm going to come back to that in a different vlog, because that's quite an important lesson, the, probably the most important lesson that life taught me. So anyway, no one ever published uh, Asylum, uh, because it probably wasn't very good. Uh, but years later, when I was writing this book about prisons, I remembered, well, I was trying for ages and ages and ages to think about a name for the prison, and I couldn't think of a good name for a prison, and then I remembered this book that I was writing uh, years and years ago, and that's it. I thought, right, Furnace Penitentiary, brilliant name, that's what it's going to be called. Numero two. The character of Alex Sawyer is actually based on me when I was a teenager. But when I was a teenager, I kind of went through a, a bit of a rough patch. When I was about 15, I, I fell in with quite a bad crowd. I started hanging out uh, in this kind of bar, uh, started drinking, started getting into fights, started stealing things to try and kind of uh, get a bit of money for this lifestyle. Really, really horrible time in my life. I kind of hated it. You know what it's like when you're kind of in a situation that you want to get out of, but you can't necessarily get out of. I remember one night I got in quite a bad fight and actually lost a tooth. I still have a missing tooth. Um, and the next day, I think my mum took me to one side and she said, you know, it's up to you how you live your life, but if you carry on like this, you're gonna end up in prison or dead. And she was completely right. So, uh, you know, I hated that life anyway, so I, I kind of stopped hanging out with those guys. I went back to my life, went back to normal. Everything turned out perfectly. It was only quite a short time in my life uh, that, you know, that I, I was that person. And everything worked out absolutely fine in the end. So years and years and years later, when I was looking for a, a story to write, I wanted to write a novel, I wanted to write a horror novel. I couldn't think of an idea. And after a while, I started to think back to this time in my life where I, I was getting into a little bit of trouble. I was never as bad as Alex, I should say. I never broke into a house or anything like that. And I started to think back to this, this time in my life and I wondered what would have happened if I'd carried on getting in trouble, if I'd gotten worse and worse trouble, if maybe one day I had started breaking into houses, if I'd stolen some things, if a friend of mine had got killed and I got framed for their murder, and gradually this idea for a book started to form inside my head. And that is where the idea for Furnace came from and that is why the main character is called Alex because he really is based on me. Number three. to the last one really. Uh, in the original draft of Furnace, Alex Sawyer's name was Alex Smith. I called the character Alexander Gordon Smith because he was kind of based on me. I even wanted the biography, the, you know, the author biography to, to read something like Alex Smith was framed for a murder he didn't commit and sent to Furnace Penitentiary. This is his story. I thought that would be so cool. But my UK publisher didn't want me to use my own name as the character's name, the full name, because I thought it might be confusing when I started to write other books. But yeah, in the original draft, he was Alexander Gordon Smith. Number four. I 
While we're on the subject of names, Z's name in the original draft was actually Z. It was called Z because obviously in the UK we don't say Z, we say Z. It's confusing already. But the problem was that when I was writing the book, I kept writing things like Z said. Z said, Z said, Z said, Z said, Z said, and it was starting to sound a bit like a Doctor Zeus book. So in the end, I decided uh, I'd go for the American spelling and call him Z. I can't even think about him being called Z now, it's totally wrong. He's definitely Z. Number five. I always try and research books as much as possible. In fact, researching books is one of my favourite parts of the job, mainly because it means you get to travel all over the place and visit the locations that you're writing about and travel the world and see all kinds of things. It's basically an excuse just to make your life an adventure, which I absolutely love. So when I was writing Furnace, uh, I knew that the book was going to be set inside a prison. And I've never actually been to a prison before, so I decided that I was going to go and investigate a prison. So I live in a place called Norwich, we do have a prison in Norwich. One day me and my little brother, he's called Jamie, uh, he's, he, was, uh, he was about 11 years old at this point. We both got in the car together and we drove up to the prison in Norwich thinking we'd just go in and have a look around, get a sense of the atmosphere. Atmosphere is so important when you're writing. Turns out you're not allowed into prisons just to have a look around. It was quite disappointing actually. So instead, what we decided to do is we decided to go and visit a medieval dungeon. Now luckily Norwich is a very, very old city. There are loads and loads of old buildings here. We've got a castle that's about a thousand years old. We've got a cathedral that's about the same sort of age. And in the middle of town, there's a building called the Guild Hall. Now this building uh, used to be the law courts about sort of four or five hundred years ago. And underneath the building are dungeons, proper dungeons. Not the kind of dungeons you get in theme parks, these were actual dungeons. If you imagine it, it's a warren of tunnels underneath the ground. No windows down there at all, hardly any light. The cells are tiny, you can touch the walls like this, this horrible claustrophobic place. The doors don't even have bars on, they're solid oak doors about this thick covered in graffiti from hundreds of years ago. So I, um, I thought this would be a great place to go and get a sense of what it was like to be inside a prison. So Jamie and I went down there, we started to walk through this place, you know, like I say, I was quite scared. Uh, you know, I thought this place used to be a prison, there are going to be ghosts down here, people will have died. And I thought Jamie was scared too, because Jamie just said, go into a cell, five seconds and then we'll go. And I thought, five seconds, I can do that. So I walked into the nearest cell, wall, 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 ceiling floor, atmosphere. Okay, I know exactly what it's like to be locked away in the prison cell. And I turned around to go, and all I saw was this huge wooden door swinging shut on my little brother's grinning face on the other side. <laughs> Slam. The door closed and I was locked in. Now originally these doors would have had a great big key, but the key was long gone. All they had was a latch, but the latch went over and I was absolutely locked in. It was pitch black in there. You could not see your hands in front of your face. I knew that cell was empty, but I thought any minute now I'm going to hear a voice in my ear going, I've got you now. I'll feel a hand on my shoulder pulling me back into the darkness. And I thought, Jamie's gonna open this door in a minute and I'm not gonna be here anymore. I'm gonna be stuck in this horrible ghost world forever and ever and ever. So I was properly panicking. I was banging on the door going, Jamie, 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 let me out. Jamie, Jamie, let me out. Please let me out. Please, 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 please. All I could hear from the other side was, no, please Jamie, please Jamie, let me out. I'm begging. 15 minutes later. I know 15 minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but I can assure you when you're stuck in a place like that, 15 minutes, feels like an eternity. 15 minutes later, he opened the door and I shot out of that cell and up, up the stairs, out into the sunshine. Best feeling ever. That experience made Furnace the book that it is today for two reasons. The first is that up until that point, Furnace Penitentiary, this prison in the book, was gonna be the kind of prison that you get anywhere in the world. Obviously not a paradise, but it's above the ground. You've got a bit of light, a bit of air. Afterwards, I knew I wanted Furnace to be more like a medieval dungeon buried beneath the ground, no natural light, hardly any air at all, this horrible, claustrophobic, subterranean place. The other reason is that when it came to writing about Alex's first night in prison, he gets life without parole, he knows he will never see the sun again, he will never see his family again. I had an idea of what that was like. Obviously, I'd only been locked away for 15 minutes, but part of me, when I was down in that cell, was thinking, what if Jamie decides he doesn't want a big brother anymore? He might have gone home, mum would have been like, where's Gordon? And he'd been like, mm -hmm. Or worse still, what if he'd locked himself inside a cell? Nobody knew we were down there really, nobody was coming to check on us. So part of me, when I was in that cell, was thinking, I am going to die in here. And I drew on that experience, I drew on those emotions. That, that, that first night when Alex is in prison, I absolutely knew what that was like. That's hopefully why it feels so real.
I've lost count. Are we on seven? The first thing I did when I finished writing Fairness was I sent it off to my agent, my also agent Sophie. Hi Sophie! I was so pleased with this book. You know, I absolutely loved writing it. I really felt that it was something special for me. And I was so excited that I misspelled the name of Furness. I misspelled the name of the book in the subject heading of the email. And instead of writing Furness, I wrote Fun Race. Yep, I called my book Fun Race. Although, Fun Race could be quite a good book. It could be about people that race in a fun sort of way. Bagsy that idea. Number six, or possibly seven. I forgot what this one is. Why is my memory so bad? I've completely forgotten. Oh, I remember. In the UK, the original title of the book was simply Furnace. But when I pitched the book to my US publisher, he said the problem with it just being called Furnace was that every single household in America pretty much has a furnace in the basement and that furnaces weren't really that scary. Although, thinking about it, every single horror film I've ever seen set in America has a scary furnace in the basement. So he suggested that instead of calling it Furnace, because people might, you know, obviously think that it's a book about the heating appliance they have in, in their house, um, he said instead of just calling it Furnace, we should call it Escape from Furnace, which gave it more of a dramatic uh, theme. Although I guess the danger was then that people might think it was a book about escaping from the heating appliance that you have in your basement, which would be a completely different type of book. But anyway, it's thanks to Wes, hey Wes, that we have the title Escape from Furnace, which I do think is better than just Furnace. It'd be like setting the book in the UK and calling it Radiator. It just doesn't work. Number seven, or again, possibly six. Or eight. The original title of the fifth Furnace book, which is now called Execution, obviously, was going to be The Crimson Mile, which is kind of a take on The Green Mile, which is an awesome book by Stephen King. And I wanted to kind of, because uh, I did read a lot of prison books and I watched a lot of prison shows before I wrote, uh, wrote the series, and I kind of wanted to um, pay homage, 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 I don't know, to Stephen King, who is probably my favourite writer of all time. And I really wanted to call the book The Crimson Mile, but it was a bit of a mouthful and it was gonna everyone was gonna have trouble kind of putting it on the side of the book because it was such a, a long kind of title. So in the end we decided on execution, which I think has a pretty cool ring to it. Number seven B When I wrote Furnace, I called the bad guy in the book Kevin Arnold. Without really thinking about where I knew the name from, I had this name in my head uh, and I ended up using it. And I completely forgot that that is the name of the lead character from The Wonder Years, which was one of my favourite shows when I was a kid. So I ended up calling this horrible, nasty piece of work, the bully, the nasty kind of leader of the skulls, Kevin Arnold, after probably one of the nicest guys in children's TV. Sorry, Kevin. Number eight. When I was writing Lockdown, the only part of the book that I really struggled with was writing about the Weezers. I kind of knew what I wanted them to be, but I couldn't, I know, you know, I kind of pictured them in my head, but I couldn't think of the words that I needed. You know, the words just weren't flowing when I was writing about the Weezers. Now, I always find the best thing to do if you're struggling with a part of a book, or if you're struggling with part of the story, if you really can't find the words, if you can see it in your head, but you can't write down the words, take a break. Trying to write through a writer's block is a bit like, for me anyway, trying to headbutt your way through a brick wall. It just does not work. So the best thing I find is to take a break and do something that's related to the story that isn't actually writing. So draw a picture, make something, uh, go and explore a place that's in the story, um, take some photographs, cut some photographs out of a magazine, make a scrapbook, anything, like I say, that's related to the world of the book that isn't actually writing. So when I was writing about the Weezers, I got really frustrated one day uh, because I could not find the right words and I thought, right, that's it, enough. I'm going to make a life-size Weezer. And I did. Everybody. I would like to introduce you to the Weezer. 
So I put this together and it was a really useful experience. A, because it gave me a, a break from the writing. It gave my brain a chance to recharge. It's staring at me, it's quite scary. B, I think it gave me a real sense of what it was like to be the character Alex. Now, when you're a writer, one of the things you really have to do is get inside the world of your story. Anything you can do to get inside your character's heads, to get inside that world of the story will really, really, really help. Because obviously, if you're writing a story from inside the world, you can see that world, you can smell it, you get a sense of everything that's going on around you. I think a lot of the time, writer's block happens because your brain is over here and the story is over here, and your brain needs to basically get across there and into the story. And you do that by kind of fully exploring the world of your story. So this really gave me a sense of what it was like to be Alex, the night that he breaks into that house with Toby, the night that he sees a Weezer uh, in the living room and the Weezer kind of picks who dies and who goes to furthest penitentiary. So it really gave me a sense of what it was like to be um, Alex inside the story. I take this round to schools with me uh, when I do events. And I actually took to, to a school once and a boy, he was about 13 years old, fainted in the middle of his class when he saw this, which was kind of hilarious. Not for him, obviously, because he had to be taken outside and he was thrown up everywhere, apparently. But it was quite funny for me. But if you're ever stuck for words, take a break, build something, make something, draw something. You don't have to be good at drawing, you don't have to be good at making things, that's not the point. It just gets you inside the world of the story. Number 23. When I was writing the furnace, I actually made a point of learning how to fire a gun. Now, in the UK, we have very, very strict gun laws. Nobody here is allowed a gun, pretty much. But one of my friends has got a hunting license, and he told me that if I wanted to learn how to fire a gun, I should go hunting with him one weekend. And I thought it'd be a good idea, because you know, I knew that the book was going to be set in a prison. I knew that the guards would have shotguns. I thought I owed it to myself as a writer to know what it was like to fire a gun. So one weekend I got in the car and I drove up uh, into the countryside with my friend and his brother. And I made a point of telling my friend that I didn't want to shoot anything living. I don't want to shoot anything living. Poor little fluffy bunnies. And he said to me, that's fine, we'll find something else for you to shoot. So we went out, first thing in the morning, nothing for miles and miles and miles, but fields. I had my own gun, the big double barrel shotgun. It was quite scary, I'd never fired one before. And my friend said to me, so, you want to fire your shotgun? I said, yes, please. He said, but you don't want to shoot anything living? I said, no, thank you. He said, well, the best thing to shoot with a shotgun, if you don't want to shoot anything living, is a cow pat. Now over here we call them cow pats, I think in America uh, you call them cow pies. Whichever way you look at it, it's a big steaming pile of cow poo. And I said to Adam, you brought me all the way up here to shoot a cow poo. This is going to be rubbish. And he said, trust me. For anyone who hasn't seen one, by the way, they're about this big. They're kind of gooey in the middle, crusty on the top. A bit like a poo pie, actually, which makes sense that you would call them cow pies. We went and found a great big cow pie. And my friend said, there you go. So I aimed my gun. I'd never fired one before. I was quite nervous. Aimed three, two, one, pulled the trigger. I soon learned that when you shoot a cow pie with a shotgun, it erupts. It's like watching a poo volcano. It goes for miles up into the air. Okay, miles might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it goes really high up into the air. Luckily, it goes away from you before raining down over the fields. And I was just like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And my friend was like, I told you. Hmm, the cat is in the room. This isn't really very helpful. I've got to tell you this, because it's so disgusting. It wasn't me and my friend up there, it was also my friend's little brother. So just to set the scene for you, we were all walking through this field. Uh, me and my friend uh, were here, and his little brother was somewhere in the distance, maybe kind of 30 yards away. And my friend and I were walking along, and suddenly we found the godfather of all cow pats. This thing was huge. It was like this big, it was a monster. And we stopped and kind of went, that thing is huge! And we thought we had to do something special with this cow pat. We couldn't just do the normal thing, we had to do something special. It deserves some kind of special treatment. So we thought what we'd do, instead of one of us shooting it with one barrel, we'd both shoot it at the same time with both barrels. There would be four lots of shot going into this cow pat instead of just one. So we weren't sure how dangerous this was, so we took quite a few steps back. We aimed our guns, three, two, one, pulled both triggers. Now it nearly ripped my arm out of its socket, it was so powerful, but that cow pie 
rose like a tidal wave. It surged up into the air. Now, because we were standing further back, the physics were different. It didn't just go doom, doom. It kind of went boom, boom, and started to roll across the hill. Um, the wind, there was a kind of a wind blowing that day, and the wind got under it and lifted it over this hill, turning it into an unstoppable tsunami of poo going right towards my friend's brother. Now, this was purely accidental. We could not have predicted this will happen, but the timing was absolutely perfect. My friend's brother was up ahead. He heard this almighty explosion four times louder than a shotgun blast, and they are loud anyway. He turned around to see what we were shooting at in time to see this wall of poo coming right towards him. All he had time to do was ah! He didn't have time to turn around. He didn't even have time to close his mouth before it went <laughs> all over him. Now, at that point, we kind of stopped shooting cow pies because really, it was very disgusting. But I'm glad I had that experience because before then, I had no idea what it was like to fire a gun. But afterwards, I knew the weight of the gun, I knew the feel of the recoil, I knew the smell of the gunpowder, even the cleaning oil on the barrel. All of it was real to me. Because it was real to me, it feels real to the characters in the book. And because it feels real to them, hopefully it feels real uh, when you read the book. So that was simply the most disgusting thing that happened uh, when researching Furnace, but uh, I'm glad I did it because uh, I got to see someone covered in cow poo. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Virtually Loads of Gordy, officially titled 10 Things That You Probably Didn't But Might Have But Should Have But Maybe Didn't But Should Have Known Some Of Them, Done Some Things, I Don't Know, uh, I'll Give Up Something About Furnace. I'll see you again really soon.